Hi, you're back with me live at the Javits Center for the Nest Summit. Today I'm joined by former Governor of Colorado, Bill Ritter. Bill is also head of the New Energy Institute and the Net Zero Utilities Board. Bill, thank you so much for being here today. Uh, thank you, Jeff. It's great to be with you. So, Bill, during Climate Week, we've obviously spent a lot of time drilling into the horrible ravages of climate risk and the things that we're going to see um, due to climate change around global warming, extreme weather, extreme heat, floods, droughts, water scarcity, all of those issues. So I, I need you to be our shining light and to tell us a little bit about what you're doing to help mitigate the damages that we're seeing and create a world where we can be sustainable and continue to live. So can you share a little bit about the positive work and impact that you're trying to have? Sure, Jeff. I'm actually at Colorado State University. It's called the Center for the New Energy Economy. I founded the center when I left the governor's office, Colorado, in January of 2011. And interestingly, if you take that nine and a half year window, we've made tremendous progress in the United States where the electricity sector is concerned, where utilities are concerned. So we work with governors, we work with legislators, we work with utility commissioners and utilities to try and do what we can to look at greenhouse gas emissions from the electricity sector and then to bend that curve. It's very kind of like COVID in that respect where we're talking about curves and bending the curve. And if we just think about the transition that's happened in that period of time since 2011, the number of uh, utilities that have, first of all, uh, dismantled coal-fired generation, which is a big fossil fuel emitter. Secondly, that have made commitments for 2030, 2035, 2040 to actually reduce their emissions in a very significant way. I think there are 16 major utilities in the United States that have made uh, real serious promises that they're going to have these 80, uh, 70, 60 uh, percent uh, emissions reduction in their in their coal-fired generation or in their fossil fuel generation. Now, it, it's not all candy and flowers because while we have seen electric generation emissions reduce, we've seen transportation emissions in the United States eclipse those. So it's not just the electricity sector, it's electricity, it's transportation, it's the industrial sector, it's the agricultural sector, and, and quite frankly, the industrial sector, if you include natural gas production as a part of that, has to capture methane. So there's a lot we have to do, but there's good news that in a fairly short of amount of time, something folks thought would take a couple of decades, that is the, the, the coal fire generation happening or declining in a serious way. That's a, a big part of the story. It happened pretty precipitously. And we're hopeful that other things can happen to replace fossil fuel emissions in America in the, at the speed that we need them and at the scale that we need them to happen. Bill, thank you. That's very encouraging to hear. I'm curious, did the effect of Pacific Gas and Electric um, going bankrupt and the fires that they had to deal with have any immediacy of impact on the other utility companies across the country? No, I don't think so. You know, Pacific Gas and Electric was actually one of the utilities that um, had no coal in their fleet or very little coal in their fleet pretty early on. They were trying to they were trying to design a future for them that wasn't about fossil fuels. Unfortunately, I think PG&E's problem in California and its bankruptcy all related to outdated infrastructure. And it's not a problem that's unique to PG&E. Uh, Southern California Edison has faced some of those same challenges, but so do utilities across America. One of the things actually we need to do, and it would be helpful from a climate perspective as well, would be to modernize the transport, the transmission grid in America. With a modernized grid, we have the capability of connecting all sectors in the United States, all regions, and then pulling uh, renewables and carbon-free uh, resources from across a greater geographic span. That can only happen with a modernized grid, and that would have been helpful as well with PG&E. Bill, thank you so much. I'd like to bring in now two colleagues, uh, Gerald Koch from DWS and Andrew Jones from Climate Interactive. Gentlemen, thank you so much for joining me today. Happy to be here. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you. I I'm going to turn this session over to Gerald right now. He's my very capable 
associate. And uh, Gerald's going to walk us through some climate modeling to understand some of the impacts of the changes that people like Bill are trying to make in the world. And what will that look like in a world of two degree warming, of rising sea level, of warming temperatures? So Gerald, please take it away. Thanks, um, Jeff. Um, I actually want to uh, turn over to uh, Andrew Jones relatively quickly um, because what we want to do today here is simulate uh, different options that we have in order to keep temperature, temperature rise down as much as possible. And um, I'm hoping that Bill will play the legislator and I will play the capital allocator and investor. <laughs> Great. And you can look at uh, what we can do, but maybe a little bit of background on Andrew. Uh, he's the co-founder of uh, Climate Interactive, and he and the team from Climate Interactive and MIT have developed a climate model that allows simulating the temperature path between today and the year 2100, and what we can do to keep temperature rise to a minimum. And uh, Drew, help us to understand what kind of impact the actions by politicians and uh, investors have on the climate. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about the model uh, yeah. and then let's solve climate change. Yeah, great. So this is a model that was built with MIT Sloan Sustainability Initiative and Climate Interactive. And it is calibrated to and tested against the integrated assessment models, the literature, scientific literature that's out there and it's built for really two groups of people, primarily people thinking about public policy, Bill and the investment world, Gerald. And you can see here, there's a top graph here, 2000 to 2100. This is where we're getting our energy. We were talking about coal a minute ago. That's the brown area. On top of it is oil for the transportation sector, natural gas in blue, wind and solar growing, but still relatively small out at the end of the century, nuclear and biomass. And then here's the pollution that's causing global warming. And then 4.1 degrees is where we're headed. So the challenge, I think, is what can we do? And let's just start, Bill, you mentioned dismantling coal. Dismantling coal. What if the whole world, and this is a global model, followed your lead? And this is in China, India, Brazil, Mexico, Indonesia, all over Africa. Um, I'm going to scroll down. And under here, you talked about getting it towards you know, 80% cuts in coal. So watch in the top left. I'm going to stop building new coal infrastructure. So watch that brown area shrink. And then imagine what do you think it's going to do over here to uh, emissions and then temperature. So think in your head, what's it going to do? And then we see, do you see the brown area going to zero? Right. I'll run it again a few times. If we stop building new infrastructure and it goes to zero around the world, it takes out a huge 0.5 degrees C. It's not a silver bullet, but it helps a good bit. So that helps. But Bill, what's next of all those things? So and, that, about, that, and that's around, around the world, world, right? So Andrew, that's around the world. That would have to be China and India as well, deciding not to build new coal exactly. infrastructure or places in you know, Africa where the Belt and Roadway uh, Initiative by China is as well. So that's a really important part. But I, would, I, would, I think one of the biggest questions, Andrew, is what we do do about natural gas. We've used natural gas to replace coal. What if we... Um, what if we looked at natural gas and said we're only going to use natural gas at about a third the rate of what we yeah. currently do? What would it look like? So what I'll do is I'm going to tax natural gas. Look at the blue area. Look at the blue area as we shrink it down and do it again. Less. See that that it's, it's about a quarter or a third. Maybe I need a little mm -hmm. bit more to get that third cut. See that? There we go. 3.6 goes down to 3.4. Less natural gas. Wind and solar grow to replace it. We'll get a little more nuclear around the world. Uh, so it's, it's not a silver bullet, but it is adding up to get us down to 3.4. What else shall we do? Well, I talked about how transportation emissions had eclipsed coal-fired generation and, and actually the electricity sector. So I think we really have to go to work on, on transportation emissions, and that would mean trying to replace the internal combustion engine with different kinds of automobiles that are fossil fuel free or that yeah. don't have emissions. Great. So I would say electrification of the transportation sector would be a very big thing here. Yeah, so let's look at that. And if we increase that significantly, we can see in the bottom right here, the electric share of final transport 
So I'm going to increase that significantly. Think about what that might do, what's going to change in the mix. Look at the red area at the top left. So we get a lot more transportation electricity. It's 70% of transportation uh, energy comes from electricity. And I'll do it again. It, it's no silver bullet, but it's another thing. As you said, bends the curve. The curve is now of emissions are not just flat. They're actually falling. So maybe shifting now over in the, in the investment world, Gerald, what needs to be added to this uh, to direct capital towards important actions in the world? We're at 3.3. We've got further to go. All right. So one thing that we are seeing a lot of institutional and retail investors do is find investment portfolios that have a lower carbon average carbon emission intensity. And basically what that means is we select investments behind that stocks uh, in from companies that basically have a uh, have a lower um, lower emissions right so yeah. I think in this model I would be looking at higher en energy efficiency in the industry and also more electrification in the industry got it thank you so look at overall buildings and industry and Right now, the world is improving at 1.2% a year. Things are getting more efficient already. What if we did that even more and watch how it reduces overall energy demand? Look at that big cut. We just don't need as much energy. We deliver services well without as much energy. And so we don't need as much gas. We don't need as much renewables. Coal has already shrunk, but that gets us another 0.2 degrees and we're bending the curve even more. And the second thing you mentioned was electrification of industry, buildings, residential. Watch as we demand more electricity. Therefore, watch the shrinking or the expanding of that green area of wind and solar. So this is more demand. If we can get the grid to work well, it's going to shrink gas. We're down at 3.0. What else? We got halfway there. What else needs to happen to get us well below two degrees. So I, I think that electrification point is very important. We're talking about the beneficial electrification of everything. You have to have a grid that's fossil fuel free in yeah. order for that to matter the way that it does for your model. But I would look. I would like to look at methane. There's a lot of discussion in the United States about methane capture and the need for methane capture, both in landfills, but also along the value chain of natural gas. Absolutely. So this is the non-CO2 greenhouse gas emissions. You can see the blue line has already departed from the black. That's because we're already shrinking those emissions from leakage from the oil and gas industry. What if we were to take other actions? In this case, 61% of what most models think is the full potential. Look at that. 3.0 takes us to 2.6. Suggests that there's a significant 0.4 degree cut just from those reductions of methane, nitrous oxide and F gases. And this is in agriculture, this is cattle, this is wastewater, landfills, et cetera. A huge, a huge reduction, 2.6. What else? It doesn't, it doesn't mean we have to necessarily stop eating cattle or making it a part of our Not diet, so. but, but there are all sorts of ways to capture that and turn it into energy and with biodigestion and things of that nature where the technology is only gonna get better. Well said, I'll give you a little bit more there. 2.5, if 74% reduction of that, yeah. What else? One thing that we did is we worked with a large uh, multinational consumer goods uh, manufacturer to help green their supply chain uh, with regards to getting more access to renewables for their suppliers. So suppliers are located in China. Uh, and what we did there is basically uh, created a fund for them to invest, co-invest yeah. with, their, with their suppliers to build uh, solar and wind farms and basically shift away from traditionally coal-fired coal uh, electricity. Fantastic, fantastic. Okay, so let's look here. If we encourage renewables, watch the green area. And some of the things that you and Bill mentioned that are necessary are breakthroughs in storage and the grid. So watch that as well will really help renewables to grow even more. Mind you, so that's 2.4. It doesn't help marginally because we've already killed coal, but expanded renewables, 2.4. Uh, what's going to get us to two? And I'm going to give you a hint to look at what the sources of emissions are. 
Here we can see land use CO2 in green, energy CO2 has shrunk a lot already. And then we have methane on top. Um, what else could we do? I have a feeling we need a legislator that will do something around uh, <laughs> carbon pricing. Uh, I'm going to hit drive you in another direction. Uh, Land-based solutions. We're going to need more. Most of these emissions are not coming from energy anymore. The emissions are coming right now from burning trees in Indonesia and Brazil. And uh, we haven't done anything to remove carbon. So that's those are some of the things that I can see might be necessary. So those are two things, right? One is reforestation, and then second, carbon renewal, removal, where we have to have some innovation for us to have economic solutions around carbon removal. Is that right? Yeah, watch what happens here. So less deforestation, that's another point one. Growing more trees, not a silver bullet, but it's another point one degree or so. And then there's this whole area of carbon uh, removal. I'll pull this up. We already have some removal here from F growing more trees. If we got some more, that's the kind of thing that comes from biochar, bioenergy, carbon capture and storage, ag soil carbon, less tilling, stores carbon in the soil, uh, direct air capture. Those are the things that could get us to two degrees. I'll add in a little bit more efficient cars and then you get below two degrees. So there it is. There's no silver bullet. It takes many seeds to plant this garden and get us there. And it requires legislation. It requires investment from the two of you. And it's still possible. Those are the big insights that we see. So Andrew, you went by something pretty quickly that's a big part of a conversation in the United States. It's carbon capture and sequestration. And the reason is because there's a lot of investment in the build out of new gas and not a great certainty around what the fate of that is in 20 or 25 years if we haven't acted on other kinds of emitting resources. So just talk about carbon capture and sequestration and where, where that's a place as a nation we should invest policy and uh, innovation, you know, dollars for, for innovation in trying to solve for carbon capture and sequestration in an economic way. Absolutely, and two ways that shows up. One of them here is these technological carbon removal, but one of the dreams for what could happen with natural gas, like if we didn't reduce it as much, is maybe there could be natural gas, carbon capture and storage, which helps as well down here. And so that's another thing to explore is whether that could help get us well below two degrees. But it really uh, speaks toward having to do a big variety of things. There's not any Absolutely. the whole time. There is no silver bullet, but there's a whole cache of solutions we have disposal at that have either um, a policy lever or technical innovation that's required in order for us to do it, but we can do this. Absolutely. And by the way, you want to create this scenario on your own. It's free, available online. Yeah, En-ROADS is the name of it. Go check it out. Thanks. So Bill, Andrew, Daryl, thank you so much for joining us today. And I think it's so interesting that people can actually go to the interactive site and be able to play with these different numbers and models and see the work that it's going to take. But on a positive note, if we all work together, we can have a future that stays well below two degrees warming scenario. I want to thank you all for the work that you're doing and thank for joining you. us at the Javits Center for the Nest Summit. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, right. Jeff. Thanks. I want to thank Bill, Andrew, and Gerald for educating us on the fact that we can have a world that stays below two degrees warming scenario. We just all have to work together. You saw a little bit of that played out today. You could find the models yourself and work with them. Thank you, everyone, for joining us at the Javits Center for the Nest Summit. <laughs>